Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and as many of you know I'm into old computers and video games and I'm also as a result interested in emulation which allows you to boot up those old computers and game consoles on a modern PC like this Mac here and emulation is generally easy to get started with but there's a lot of different pieces that you have to grab from everywhere and if you were just casually looking to run some old piece of software to see what it was like it might be more trouble than it's worth but lately there have been a bunch of really high performance emulators popping up online that allow you to point your web browser at a URL and in seconds like you see here boot up in this instance a Mac Quadra and you can run a bunch of software like it's the 90s all over again without having to set up anything and I thought this would be really fun to take a look at and I've put together a collection of a bunch of stuff that you can get started with with only a single click and I'm sure there's a lot more out there so there will undoubtedly be a follow-up at some point but let's take a look at what I've collected for this video right now. Now what you saw me boot up at the outset is something called System7.app. There's also one called MacOS8.app. Now the one we're running right now is the System7 one, and this actually runs a version of MacOS 7.5.3. This is kind of what I was running on my old PowerBook back in the day. Uh, but things are a lot faster on this emulator because this is running with the full power of my modern MacBook Pro here. And what's neat about this is that in addition to getting the emulator, you also get a whole bunch of software that they've pre-installed in this folder called Infinite HD. And I have a folder here already opened up and I can just load up a game like Another World here and let's do it at uh, 640 by 480 and see how it fares. And you can boot this up and actually start playing with a bunch of the software that they have pre-installed. And as you can see, everything kind of just runs at the same speed you might remember an old Mac running at here, including all the sound effects and everything else. It's actually pretty amazing how smooth all of this is running, especially given that it's running inside of a web browser at the moment, but it is accomplishing that. And games like this one run great. You will run into some issues. I did have a problem with a couple of games that I tried playing with, and the developer is working on fixing some of those things. But by and large, if you wanted the experience of a 90s computer, you've got it here. Now, one of the problems with running an emulator in a web browser is that it's hard to get data in and out of it. And this is something else that has been addressed here in this emulator. It's not perfect, but it is better than what I've seen in a few others that we're going to cover in a minute. So for example, I've got this disk image that I made from an old floppy disk that I had in my collection. And I can just copy it over to the Mac here. And then I just have to restart the emulator. And that floppy disk now is mounted as a disk image here. And I can actually run software uh, off of an old floppy that I again imaged a few years back and stored in my big repository here. So if you had old software that you wanted to try to play around with, you could get that to work. You can also move files over. So I have an old uh, Word doc here that I drafted on my 1994 PowerBook. And if I drag it into the window here, and then I go over to this folder called the outside world, I'll get you a closer look at it and I go over to Downloads, you will see that document here. Now, it's not going to open up right away, but what I can do is go back to our infinite hard drive, go to Productivity, and they have the old version of Microsoft Word. This is Word, I think, 5.1a, which was an awesome version of Microsoft Word. And if I go over here to Open, I can select that Outside World file here and or folder and go to Downloads, and I can go ahead and just load that up by selecting all files here. And you can see, boom, we've got everything formatted exactly like I had in high school here. I'll give you a closer look. And this was a uh, script that we were doing for our television show that we did for the high school. I, had, I was the director of, the, camp, of the, the high school, I should say, not the campus, the high school TV show, which is pretty cool. I've got some old tapes of this kicking around too. And it's really neat. And it all just works. You can just drag stuff in there and you're off and running. You get some glitchiness, as you can see, with this. But um, again, the author is working on addressing some of that. One last thing that I thought was pretty cool is that you can download things out of the emulator, too, through that 
outside world folder. So for example, if I wanted to uh, maybe save this document and then uh, grab it from my archive, I can just drag the file over here to the uploads folder. And when I do that, it's actually going to give me the option to download this onto my Mac. So you can get files in and out of it, which is really neat. Uh, one last thing is that they have a folder here called saved. And this is what will attempt to keep your files consistent between sessions, but I would not rely on this. And the reason is, is that even though this is a web-based emulator, it's not running on the internet. It is using the internet to download the emulation software and then the disk image to load up the operating system and all of the vintage software that you might be running on the emulator. But everything is happening here. So when I drag a file in, like that disk image or that Word document, it's not going up to a server. It's actually just getting loaded into the browser's file store. So if you want something more reliable, uh, at least from a file standpoint, I would look at Basilisk 2, which runs 68K Max in emulation, or SheepShaver, uh, which will emulate a PowerPC-based Mac. But you have to go out and find the ROMs and the operating system and get your, your software all loaded in in a certain way. And what's fun about this emulator that you can run on the web is that it's one click to get started. And you can actually get all of your software set up, compress it, download it, and then load it into uh, SheepShaver or Basilisk 2 later. So this is a good starting point if you wanted to build out uh, some old Mac. And it really runs quite nicely on even lower end hardware. I was able to boot it up on my old iPad Pro the other day. No problem there. I was not able to get it to run on my kids' fifth or sixth generation entry level iPad. So I think you probably need at least two or three gigabytes of memory to get started. But if you've got a minimally specced out computer or Chromebook, this should work just fine. Uh, there is an option to make it go full screen, so you can click on the little apple here and that will extend it out. I was noticing when I was capturing the footage that it didn't look so great for capture purposes, but uh, you can do that to get a little bit more screen real estate so you're not squinting at it all the time. But overall, just a really uh, amazing piece of work here. If you want to learn more about how they were able to get this to work so well, uh, visit this link. And this will take you over to the website of the developer Mihai Parparita. And he details all the different things that went into making this work. And actually, the code you're running is the Basilisk, Basilisk 2 code that you would normally download and run locally on your computer. But he ported it over to a new standard called WebASM, WebAssembly. And that allows you to uh, basically run the software at native speed. So the browser doesn't add much, if any, overhead to the mix. And there's a lot of potential here to do other things like this, even with modern software. Now, next up is the Internet Archive. And they've been running these in-browser emulators for quite some time. Uh, what I found to be the most interesting from a historical standpoint is their historical software collection. And if you visit that area of their site, and go over to the about here, uh, you'll get kind of a guided tour of some of the firsts that were available in the computing world. And what I really like about this is that in addition to just seeing a screenshot, you can actually click on VisiCalc and then boot it up and experience what VisiCalc was like to run on an Apple II Plus. And you'll see it booting up an Apple II Plus right here. I'll go full screen with it now so you can get a better look at it. And it will take a little bit of time to load because it does have to download the emulator and the disk image. And then, of course, it is running at the native speed of that Apple II. But here we are. We've got ourselves a spreadsheet. And I can put in some values here. Uh, and we can do a little uh, calculation. So we'll say sum A1 to B1. Hit the Enter key. And we've got some calculations going on there. What's funny is that the Apple II did not have a down arrow key. So if you hit the down arrow key on your modern computer, you'll just get a beep. So you have to hit the space bar. That will convert it to downward motion. And then you can hit the left or right arrow key to go up or down. And what I found to be really neat about this is that if you put in another value here, and then go down a notch and then sum this up. Let me just do this real quick. Now, this from a modern spreadsheet standpoint is not all that interesting. But think about this in the context of when this came out. Because at the time, it was just completely 
new to have a spreadsheet and to have something that you could program this easily and have numbers change on the fly like this was a major game changer. And this is why people started buying computers was because of the spreadsheet. This was like the first killer app. So in addition to reading about it, you can experience it. And if you think about this from the standpoint of education, you can have your students go to this website and actually run the software to appreciate what they have now. It's a great learning tool and they've got everything really nicely curated here in the historical software collection. And you're not just limited to the Apple II, they've got a version of WordStar here that is running on the old Osborne platform. Uh, you can also uh, pop open the Atari demo disc and see what it was like to walk into a computer store and have this kind of running on a loop so you could be pitched on purchasing an Atari. And this is loading up a Atari 800 emulator. You can hear that clicking, which is normal for what it would do when it was loading things up. And then you've got the demo here running complete with sound. Pretty neat stuff. And again, one click from your web browser. Now also on the Internet Archive is the Internet Arcade, and they've got a lot of stuff here as well. If you go to the About section here, they do have some curation, so you can find some of the more popular games that are known to run well on this platform. I have NBA Jam here running uh, in the background, and it works great, sound and all. I did find that my game controller worked with this also, that I had paired up via Bluetooth. Um, but not all games support that. So uh, it's a hit or miss kind of thing, but again, for a quick uh, experimentation to see how things might have looked or ran back in the day, this is a very quick way to get up and started with an emulator without having to go track down ROM files and other things. And one other thing on the Internet Archive to talk about, and that is their console living room. And here they have collected most of the popular game consoles that have ever existed and allow you to mess around with those. So for example, I could jump into the Atari 2600 here and maybe load up a quick game of Pitfall. And as you can see, it's going to download that and get started. Of course, the emulator itself takes up uh, more room and bandwidth than the actual ROM file did. I think this game was maybe 2K or 4K tops. Uh, and we'll let that finish downloading here. And once it gets started, you will have yourself an Atari 2600 running in your web browser, and then you can jump through a bunch of the other systems that they have archived here. Again, just a quick and easy way to experience the way things used to be without having to jump through hoops. Now, this next one is called V86, and this allows you to boot up versions of different PC operating systems. And some of these are actually fairly close to recent ones, but you can jump into something, for example, like Windows 3.1, and it'll load up MS-DOS like it did back in the old days, and it will do your uh, high mem sys here, and then boom, you've got yourself Windows 3.1, and we can jump into the games area here, and maybe load up a game of Solitaire or Minesweeper. Windows 3.1 runs really nicely on this. It's really uh, pretty cool to just pop in here and play around with a vanilla Windows installation. This is not as flexible as what you saw with that Mac emulator earlier, so you can't drag in things just to boot them up. It does support disk images, but I was not able to get any to work based on how I usually make them for emulators. I think you have to download some QEMU tools to get that working. But if you just wanted to explore what these old operating systems were like, this is a really quick way to do it. Uh, here is Windows 95. Some of these actually just boot up like immediately, and I think it's because they have them as a save state, so you don't have to go through the entire OS booting process. So there's Windows 95, here is Windows 2000, and again, it's so quick you think, geez, is this actually running or is this some kind of simulator? But no, in fact, it is an emulator. You can see when you start to do something, it does take it a little bit, bit of time initially to respond to that. Um, so the performance here, especially for a more advanced operating system isn't great. You saw how fast it was on Windows 3. Windows 2000 is a little more sluggish. Um, but they also have some Linux distributions here. So for example, we could load up, let me find it here, uh, FreeBSD. And this is uh, version 12, the base install. And they restored that from a snapshot here. So that will boot up pretty quickly. So you can mess around with this and have 
some fun kind of experimenting with different things. And again, you can also load in your own disk images. So if you did have something that you could get to work with it, it'll boot that up too. And like the other things that we've looked at, this is all running locally on your computer. So when you put a disk image in, the disk image is being stored here and nowhere else. So it's not getting sent to them. They're just sending you the emulation files. And if you wanted more information about the underlying technology here, uh, head over to lon.tv slash wasm, and that'll take you to the WebAssembly homepage to learn more about how this is working and how these things can run so quickly in a web browser. And that's going to do it for my quick look at one-click emulation, but I know there is more out there. This is what I've been able to find so far. So if you've got a favorite emulator that you're running that's pretty simple to get up and running, leave a link in the comment section, and we'll cover it in a future video. This week's wrap-up is being brought to you, as always, by all of you. And I want to thank Chanflay98 for making a super chat the other day. We also have a new supporter on the channel, Jason Butler. Uh, joined us during a live stream as a new member using the YouTube membership system. So I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution via my donor box page. We also support the YouTube membership program, Patreon, and Floatplane. And if you want to follow me in other places, you sure can, because I am all over the place. We've got my extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content. We also have my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop, where you can find most of my videos and live streams completely ad-free. So definitely check that out. We have a very infrequent email list you can subscribe to at lon.tv slash email. Anytime I've got something big going on in the channel, we update you there. We also have the Facebook group, the Discord, and the Telegram channels that you can find on screen here and down below in the video description. And I also have a store where I sell previously reviewed items. And these are things that I bought and I'm now getting rid of. These are usually pretty close to brand new and sold below the retail price. And if you wanted to get notified every time I add something to that store, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert. And that's a special email list just for the store. And anytime something gets added, you will get a notification. That is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. This was a lot of fun because I found some things that I hadn't even heard of before, like that V86. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what you might be doing with web-based emulation. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Jim Tannis and Tom Albrecht, Hot Sauce and Video Games and Eric's Variety Channel, Brian Parker and Frank Goldman, Amda Brown and Matt Zagaya, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.